Hello and welcome to Dramatis Lectio, the show that I occasionally fall back into when I have no other options available. And thanks to the recent internet crisis, that's exactly the case. Anyhow, hi there, everyone. <clears throat> Almost lost my voice there. Hi there, everyone. So last time on Doki Doki Horwell High School, notice me, big Honi Sama Senpai Desu, or whatever you want to call it, I became flustered over the most recent development of the book. I've had an entire hour worth of time to complain and criticize it, so I will just move on and get right into the following chapter. So, here we go, part two, chapter two. <clears throat> Hi Chuck, just calling to wish you a happy new year. Do you love me, Chuck? I'm sorry, but your call cannot go through. Please hang up and do not dial again. I'm thinking maybe when I grow up I'll be a beauty queen. Do you have to be really beautiful? Probably. Do they have a sort of fairly kind of, you know, cute queen? King of the hill! I am the king! I am the king of the hill! I am the queen! I am the queen of the hill! I am the attorney! I am king of the hill! I have the deed of trust! Will you miss me while I'm gone? He asked. Why? She said. Where are you going? Don't you remember? He said. I'm going on an expedition and I'll be gone for 25 years. I'm sorry, she said. I guess I wasn't listening. Yes, ma'am, I brought my dog to school today. Well, sometimes he gets lonely. No, ma'am, he won't create a disturbance. Maybe. Zzzz. Mom? <laughs> my dog wants to go out in the hall for a drink of water. A little problem, ma'am. There's a fountain out there, but no water dish. Do you have a water dish? Dogs are worth it, ma'am. Wait a minute. This isn't Orwell. This is Peanuts. <laughs> Silly me. I've been reading the wrong book. <laughs> uh, I bet you couldn't tell the difference, though. That was such a seamless transition, wasn't it? Right, now, okay, on to the real book this time, unfortunately. <clears throat> Here we go, part two, chapter two. Winston picked his way up the lane through dappled light and shade, stepping out into pools of gold wherever the bows parted. Under the trees to the left of him, the ground was misty with bluebells. The air seemed to kiss one's skin. It was the 2nd of May. From somewhere deeper in the heart of the wood came the droning of ringdoves. He was a bit early. There had been no difficulties about the journey, and the girl was so evidently experienced that he was less frightened than he would normally have been. Presumably, she could be trusted to find a safe place. Hashtag safe place. Or not. That was my window. We are having not a nice weather. <clears throat> in general, you could not assume that you were much safer in the country than in London. There were no telescreens, of course, but there was always the danger of concealed microphones by which your voice might be picked up and recognized. Besides, 
It was not easy to make a journey by yourself without attracting attention. For distances of less than a hundred kilometers, curse you, metric system! <laughs> you destroyed the pint! The pint! The sacred pint! <laughs> it was not necessary to get your passport endorsed. But sometimes there were patrols hanging about the railway stations who examined the papers of any party member they found there and asked awkward questions about as much awkwardness as the awkward pose I gave you as I turned the page. However, no patrols had appeared, and on the walk from the station he had made sure, by cautious backward glances, that he was not being followed. The train was full of prowls, in holiday mood because of the summery weather. The wooden seated carriage in which he travelled was filled to overflowing by a single enormous family, ranging from a toothless great-grandmother to a month-old baby, going out to spend an afternoon with in-laws in the country and, as they freely explained to Winston, to get hold of a little black market butter. Hmm, creamy delicious butter, of which I have a sudden crave. Hmm. The lane widened, and in a minute he came to the footpath she had told him of, a mere cattle truck which plunged between the bushes. He had no watch, but he could not be fifteen yet. The bluebells were so thick underfoot that it was impossible not to thread on them. He knelt down and began picking some, partly to pass the time anyway. You know, some men were arrested for picking up flowers. Wait, I'm thinking of the secret of Monkey Island. <clears throat> I had a joke there. I assure you, I had it in my mind. But just l like my <clears throat> ability to take this book seriously, poof, it has gone. It has left these mortal coils, so to speak. <clears throat> but also from a vague idea that he would like to have a bunch of flowers to offer to the girl when they met. <laughs> ah, that is so passé. He had got together a big bunch and was smelling their faint, sickly scent when a sound at his back froze him. The unmistakable crackle of a foot on twigs. He went on picking bluebells. It was the best thing to do. It might be the girl, or he might have been followed after all. To look round was to show guilt. He picked another and another and another and another. A hand fell lightly on his shoulder. He looked up. It was the girl! Hooray! You know, we still don't know what her name is. All we know is that she is the girl of his literal wet dreams. She is not a character as far as we the readers are concerned. She is a vehicle for the main protagonist's own fantasies and wish-fulfillment, which, by proxy, it should reflect George Orwell's own wish-fulfillment. You know, again, it's no wonder that so many young adult novels take direct inspiration from this book, because this is 
slowly turning into the original young adult novel, let me tell you. And that's not a route you want to go to. Not because romance stories are inherently bad, I'm not saying that, but because most romance stories, especially the ones aimed at teenagers, tend to be awfully written. Because... They rely heavily on tropes that are painfully mm, offensive. But then again, if that is your trash, I have no um, right to judge you. But back to the original point, I don't think this book will be a very satisfying read in the near future. That is all I'm saying. <clears throat> She shook her head, evidently as a warning that he must keep silent, then parted the bushes and quickly led the way along the narrow track into the wood. Obviously, she had been that way before, for she dodged the boggy bits as though by habit. Winston followed, still clasping his bunch of flowers. His first feeling was relief. But, as he watched the strong, slender body moving in front of him, with the scarlet sash that was just tight enough to bring out the curve of her hips... Do you see what I mean? <laughs> Do you see what I mean, people? The sense of his own inferiority was heavy upon him. Even now, it seemed quite likely that when she turned round and looked at him, she would draw back after all. The sweetness of the air and the greenness of the leaves daunted him. Okay, so be honest with me. Put yourself in my shoes. If I were to start reading this book from this chapter, by just because of the description alone, would you be able to gather that, that this was 1984 by George Orwell? That this was a dystopian, futuristic, science fiction novel that tries to weigh in on the issues of authoritarianism? No? That's what I thought. <clears throat> This, uh, already on the walk from the station, the May sunshine had made him feel dirty and etiolated. A creature of indoors with the sooty dust of London in the pores of his skin. It occurred to him that till now he had probably never seen him... Oh, she had probably... Never seen him. For a moment, this turned into a very different novel. <laughs> mm. In broad daylight in the open, they came to the fallen tree that she had spoken of. The girl hopped over it and forced apart the bushes, in which there did not seem to be an opening. When Winston followed her, he found that they were in a natural clearing. A tiny grass knoll, surrounded by tall saplings that snut it in completely. This is starting to sound like my experience with playing Zork, the underground empire. Go left, go right, to the clearing. There is a grate in the middle of it. Kick the grate! Damn you, Ross! It's a long story, and this is pretty much as inside a joke can possibly get. <clears throat> the girl stopped and turned. Here we are, she said. He was facing her at several paces distance. As yet he did not dare move nearer her to her. I didn't want to say anything in the lane, she went on. In case there is a mic hidden there. I don't suppose there is, but there could be. There's always the chance of one of those swine recognizing your voice. We're all right here. He still had not the courage to approach her. We're all right here? He repeated, 
stupidly. Stupidly doesn't really sound good as an adjective. Yes, look at the trees. Oh my god, is this going to turn into a pro-environmental let's go back to the country message? <laughs> because urban life is bad. Oh my gosh. You know, come to think of it, that seemed to be the recurring point for a lot of this very specific kind of literature back in the day. Have you guys ever read Fahrenheit 451? Well, I have, and it pretty much ends with the main character escaping to the country outside of the restrained confines of the city which was under the authoritarian regime and whatnot. Uh, and everything was controlled by the media that served the purpose of whomever was in charge. And these books are very similar, actually, come to think of it. So, yes, that was a recurring theme. The country is better than the city, because the country... Um, connects you with the nature and the freedom that nature represents and it's nostalgic and all that whereas the city is big ugly inhumane and um, coercive and it's devoid of freedom and individuality and all of that boring trite jazz <laughs> by the way i live outside in the country it's quite nice, so I don't even know why I'm complaining about this. But I... Okay, yes, I do have a reason to complain. I have to go to the city every once in a while, because I can't just be stuck here out in the country, and out in the country there is seemingly nothing to do. So there. Okay, look at the trees, she said. They were small ashes, which at some time had been cut down and had sprouted up again into a forest of poles, none of them thicker than one's wrist. There's nothing big enough to hide a mic in. Besides, I've been here before. They were only making conversation. He had managed to move closer to her now. She stood before him very upright, with a smile on her face that looked faintly ironical, as though she were wondering why she was so slow. He! Damn it! He was so slow to act. The bluebells had cascaded into the ground. They seemed to have fallen on their own accord. He took her hand. Even more um, similitudes between uh, 1984 and Fahrenheit. Um, they both feature the point of view of a middle-aged uh, male protagonist who starts only now to question how the world works. And there is a significantly younger woman whom is not a real character for most of the book that serves the purpose of enlightening him towards what is uh, the true meaning of freedom and what have you. Hmm, you know, I would have to look up which book was written before or after the other because these points of comparison seem to be too similar for comfort. They are very similar novels, that's what I'm saying, down to a very specific formula, in fact, which is mighty suspicious, if you ask me. <clears throat> he took her hand. He took her hand. Oh, guys, 
This is it's happening. It's totally happening, guys. He's taking your hand, guys. Who? Please contain yourself. Oh, I feel the hormones are exploding here. Oh my gosh. This is so. Oh, this is so romantic. This is so. Ah. Oh. Anyway. Would you believe, he said, that till this moment I didn't know what color your eyes were? This romance has very strong foundations, doesn't it? They were brown, he noted, a rather light shade of brown with dark lashes. Now that you've seen what I'm really like, can you still bear to look at me? Yes, easily. Oh, I know you're an ugly middle-aged man, but it's not what's outside that counts. It's what is inside, Beauty and the Beast. Blech. Except it's a complete farce. And you know it. And it goes both ways, by the way. I'm 39 years old. I've got a wife that I can get rid of. I, You know what? I almost completely forgot that Winston here had a wife since she barely gets mentioned every once in a while. Come to think of it, the other guy in Fahrenheit 451 also had a pretty terrible despondent wife that he could not stand. Oh my gosh! These books, all of these books, they are the middle-aged man wish fulfillment fantasy. Come on, don't you see it? They are trapped in their boring office lives, in their boring existence, in their boring routines and livelihood. They have a wife that they are bored with and suddenly... <gasps> A much younger girl shows interest in us? In me specifically? A middle-aged man? And I am so ugly? And yet she loves me for who I am? <gasps> I believe I can fly. You're a blockhead, and an hairhead, you're a noodle neck, you're a pizzle wheat and a dim bulb. The old words still work the best. Did anyone call while I was out? I didn't know you were out. Well, did anyone call? Call who? Me! Did anyone call me while I was out? Why would anyone call you? As soon as I'm 35, I think I leave home. Okay, guilty on charge, I'm back reading Peanuts, but would you rather <laughs> me continue reading this thing over here or, you know, start reading Peanuts instead? Because I'm all for reading Peanuts, I'm all for having a good time on this show. I wonder what it would be like if our roles were reversed, he, Charlie Brown, said to Snoopy, his loyal dog. What if you were the master and I were your dog? Snoopy look at Charlie Brown with a furrowed brow. I thought I was the master, he said, not in mirth. Okay. It's a comic. I can't exactly um, read it in an audio show. I would have to show it so it doesn't work inherently, that is. I guess I'm stuck in the year of 1984, I guess. <clears throat> Which, again, it's the 1984 as imagined 20 years prior, at the very least. I'm 39 years old. I've got a wife I can't get rid of. I've got varicose veins. I've got five false teeth. 
Jeez Louise, man. I couldn't care less, said the ideal girl of all men's dreams. I cannot get over how creepy this whole affair is. The next moment, it was hard to say by whose act she was in his arms. At the beginning, he had no feeling except sheer incredulity. The youthful body was strained against his own. The mass of dark hair was against his face. And yes! Exclamation point. Actually, she had turned her face up and he was kissing the wide red mouth. Okay. Exclamation point still counts as a period. And yet the actually that follows does not have a capital A. I realize I may be a bit of a stickler here, but I am in full-on nitpicking mood at this rate. Can you really blame me? I keep asking you questions, but you clearly cannot answer them, so it's kind of pointless of me, isn't it? Did I mention that I am going insane? <laughs> and it's raining outside, so I hope the sound of rain does not get picked up by my fairly powerful microphone. That's all I'm saying. Huh, the rain is actually quite soothing. Hmm, so soothing. Anyway. She had clasped her arms about, uh, about his neck. She was calling him darling, precious one, loved one. This is making me feel nauseous. This is nauseating. He had pulled her down onto the ground. Oh no! She was utterly unresisting. He could do what he liked with her. Why do you have to phrase it like this? It's consensual, completely consensual. Why do you have to phrase it like he's about to freaking rape her? For crying out loud, George son! And it's thundering outside to exclaim my indignancy at this. <sighs> but the truth was that he had no physical sensation, except that of mere contact. All he felt was incredulity and pride. He was glad that this was happening, but he had no physical desire. It was too soon. Her youth and prettiness had frightened him. He was too much used to living without women. He did not know the reason. The girl picked herself up and pulled a bluebell out of her hair. She sat against him, putting her arm round his waist. Well, you know what? At least there is a sliver, a really small sliver of... Uh, hmm, what's the word I'm looking for? Believability. Verosimilitude. Realism in this exchange here. It's a really, really small, small thing, but it's better than nothing, I suppose. Any other novel at this point would have just had the guy just get on top of the girl and, mm, oh yeah, baby, oh, I'm 20 years old again, oh yeah! And don't think for a flat second that this isn't the direction that the novel is taking, because it seems to be the case here. I'll be very surprised if it's not. <clears throat> that was a poor, gross display on my part, I apologize. <laughs> I feel kind of bad about it, but then again, not really. 
Never mind, dear, there's no hurry. We've got the whole afternoon. Isn't this a splendid eye out? By the description that you gave me, it's not a very Heidi eye out. I found it when I got lost once on a community hike. If anyone was coming, you could hear them a hundred meters away. So, um... How much is... Uh, hold on. How much is a hundred meters measured in beer pints? Can you do that measurement for me? <laughs> oh. Mm -hmm. What is your name, said Winston to the woman he almost had sex with? Jeez Louise, Winston. Julia, I know yours. It's Winston. Winston Smith. I've been stalking you, you see. How did you find that out? I expect I'm better at finding things out than you are, dear. She just confirmed that she is a stalker! I was joking! Why is this novel so bad? Why is this all-important inspiration of a novel that was the groundwork for an entire generation and more of science fiction writers. Why is this novel so hard to get through? Tell me, what did you think of me before that day I gave you the note? Oh, well, you see, uh, you, there was this... <laughs> it's a really funny story, you see. Uh, there was this one time in which I fantasized about cracking your skull open because I thought you were a spy. <laughs> a crazy day, am I right? <laughs> and that's the end of the novel. Goodbye. <laughs> if only. He did not feel any temptation to tell lies to her. It was even a sort of love offering to start off by telling the worst. I hated the sight of you. I was joking! <laughs> he actually goes and say it! I was joking! <laughs> and I keep predicting what this character are going to say next. I swear to you, I am reading with my mind along with my mouth reading, which is to say, I am not looking for sentences and phrases and paragraphs um, beyond the point of where I'm currently at as I read this. So I do not see these sentences coming before I actually see them coming. So it's as much as a surprise to me as it is for you that all of my awful jokes turn out to be perfectly timed. Oh boy! I hated the sight of you, he said. I wanted to rape you and then murder you. I'm done! I'm done. Where is it now? Uh, where is it? Uh, where did it fall? Damn it! Stupid! Stupid! <laughs> okay, this is a bit... Uh, this is a bit uh, awkward. I cannot find the book. I threw it somewhere in a fit of rage, and I've lost the sight of it. 
Where is it? Oh, there it is. I found it. I wish I didn't. Uh, uh, oh, there it is. <sighs> so, I hate to do this. I hate to bring real world logic into a novel. that's specifically taking place in a alternative history by, well, by the time it was written it was a hypothetical future but um, actually specifically because this was written as a hypothetical future it means that it had basis in um, real life and therefore, real-life logic should apply here. When a guy tells a girl that her first thought was that he wanted to rape her, that's it. That's the end of that discussion. That's the end of any hope of a budding romance that could ever come out of it. Because the real world logic would dictate that the girl would be too busy running away from this obviously crazy maniac because he's a potential sexual offender who just very much stated he was. But no, no, in Orwell's imaginary world for lonely people, apparently, uh... The beautiful girl is... <sighs> only exists to fulfill the fantasy of the male protagonist which the reader is supposed to identify himself with. This is your masterpiece of future dystopias. This is your science fiction classic. This is your all-time great that has inspired an entire generation of writers. This is your magnum opus. A guy says to a girl, I fantasized of raping you. And there's still a romance after that. This book can burn in hell. I'm starting to believe, and here is a headcanon theory, that the girl is not actually human, she is a robot created specifically to uh, fulfill the desires of old creepy men, middle-aged men at the very least, since he's 39 and whatnot, <sighs> so that they can basically uh, just get out of their system, their worst kinks, onto the robot so that uh, uh, there won't be any actual legal consequence to that because it's just a robot, not a real woman. That would be a much more interesting story now, wouldn't it? And it would fix the inherent problem here of actual human interaction with a human being. <laughs> Which is not even a real character, as we established. She is a vehicle for a fulfilling fantasy. I cannot get over this, and I will never get over this. This is garbage. This is absolute <laughs> unforgivable garbage. This is not even funny anymore. Okay. Oh, how long is this chapter? Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six or so pages. Okay, here's the deal. I'm going to finish reading this chapter and then I will evaluate and review 
if I should ever continue reading this book in the future. Honestly, I'm starting to think I should take a break from this and just put it aside and not touch it ever again. But we'll see about that. You know, when a woman says to you that they respect honesty above everything else, there is a freaking limit to how honest you can be. There's being honest and open, and then there is this, I wanted to rape you, because I hated you. <clears throat> I wanted to rape you and then murder you afterwards. Two weeks ago I thought seriously of smashing your head in with a cobblestone. If you really want to know, I imagine that you had something to do with the foot police. The girl laughed delightedly. <laughs> you almost raped me and murdered me with a cobblestone. Because you are a, you're a, because you're a paranoid freak. That is somehow hilarious to me. I am human girl. Ha ha ha. I react to your mirth. Ha 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 ha. This is not creepy at all. Ha 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 ha. Every. Every new phrase, every new paragraph in this book infuriates me at this point. The girl laughed delightedly at the thought of being raped, evidently taking this as a tribute to the excellence of her disguise. Not the thought police! You didn't honestly think that? Well, perhaps not exactly that, but from your general appearance, merely because you're young and fresh and healthy, you understand, I thought that probably... You thought I was a good party member. Pure in word and deed. Banners, processions, slogans, games, community hikes, all that stuff. And you thought that if I had a quarter of a chance, I'd denounce you as a thought criminal and get you killed off? Yes, something of that kind. A great many young girls are like that, you know. It's this bloody thing that does it, she said, ripping off the scarlet sash of the Junior Anti-Sex League. Oh, the, the Junior Anti-Sex League, don't mess with that! Wait. Junior? Junior Anti-Sex League? How old is this woman? This is a legitimate concern now. How old is this girl? If she's carrying around a Girl Scout sash. What am I even reading here? What is this? What is this? What happened to the excellent world building and all of the stuff having to do with uh, psychological and sexual oppression and the big brother always watching you and the telescreens. What is this fun fiction garbage? Mm. The junior anti-sex league and flinging it onto a board, a ball, a ball. B-O-U-G-H. I actually don't remember how am I supposed to read it, but I don't care. Then, as though touching her waist had reminded her of something, she felt in the pocket of her overalls and produced a small slab of chocolate. <gasps> CHOCOLATE! She broke it in half and gave one of the pieces to Winston. Even before he had taken it, he knew by the smell that it was very unusual chocolate. It was dark and shiny, and was wrapped in silver paper. Chocolate normally was dull, dull brown, crumbly stuff that tasted 
as nearly as one could describe it, like the smoke of a rubbish fire. But at some time or another, he had tasted a chocolate like the piece she had given him. The first whiff of its scent had stirred up some memory which he could not pin down, but which was powerful and troubling. Whoa, bro, where did you get this stuff? he said. Black market, she said indifferently. Actually, I am that sort of girl to look at. I'm good at games. I was a troop leader in the spies. I do voluntary work three evenings a week for the junior... The junior anti-sex league. Hours and hours I've spent pasting their bloody rot all over London. I always carry one hand of a banner in the processions. I always look cheerful and I, and I never shirk anything. Always yell with the crowd. That's what I say. It's the only way to be safe. The first fragment of chocolate had melted on Winston's tongue. The taste was delightful. But there was still that memory moving around the edges of his consciousness, something strongly felt but not reducible to definite shape. The shape of chocolate. <laughs> The story of a romance between a woman and a chocolate Easter bunny. <laughs> it would still be much more compelling and, than reading this. Hmm. Like an object seen out of the corner of one's eye, he pushed it away from him, aware only that it was the memory of some action which he would have liked to undo, but could not. You are very young, he said. How young? Give me a number, book. I double dare you. You are ten or, or you are ten or fifteen years younger than I am. Oh, thank God! Oh, thank God! She's an adult. Oh my God! Oh, I was scared there for a minute. Jeez! <clears throat> you are ten or fifteen years younger than I am. What could you see to attract you in a man like me? Is it my fake teeth? They are very sexy. It was something in your face. I thought I'd take a chance. I'm good at spotting people who don't belong. As soon as I saw you, I knew you were against them. This is somewhere in between the manic pixie girl trope and the magical black man trope. The magical girlfriend trope, I guess. That's actually, come to think of it, an actual anime genre. She's Belle Dandy from Oh My Goddess, the perfect woman, essentially. Them, it appeared, meant the party, and above all the inner party about whom she talked with an open jeering hatred which made Winston feel uneasy, although he knew that they were safe, and if they could be safe anywhere. They were safe here if they could be safe anywhere. That's the correct one. A thing that astonished him about her was the coarseness of her language. Party members were supposed not to swear, and Winston himself very seldom did swear, aloud, at any rate, 
Julia, however, seemed unable to mention the party, and especially the inner party, without using the kind of words that you so chalked up in dripping alleyways. He did not dislike it. It's a kink play. <laughs> it was merely one symptom of a revolt against the party and all its ways, and somehow it seemed natural and healthy like the sneeze of a horse that smells bad hay. They had left the clearing and were wandering again through the checkered shade, with their arms round each other's waists whenever it was wide enough to walk two abreast. He noticed how much softer her waist seemed to feel now that the, 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 the bloody... Bloody Junior Anti-Sex League Sash was gone. They did not speak above a whisper. Outside the clearing, Julia said it was better to go quietly. Presently, they had reached the edge of the little wood. She stopped him. Don't go out into that light. I mean, into the open. There might be someone watching. We're all right if we keep behind the bows. They were standing in the shade of hazel bushes. The sunlight filtering through innumerable leaves was still hot on their faces. Winston looked out into the field beyond and underwent a curious, sh slow shock of recognition. He knew it by sight. An old, close-bitten pasture, with a footpath wandering across it, and a molehill here and there. In the rugged hedge on the opposite side, the boughs of the helm's trees swayed just perceptibly in the breeze, and their leaves stirred faintly in dense masses like women's hair. Hi, I'm George Orwell. I'm a writer. I like flourishing literature. And you have to read it all. And you have to enjoy it. Yes. Enjoy my literature. Yes. <laughs> <clears throat> I am bitter. Surely somewhere nearby, but out of sight, there must be a stream with green pools where days were swimming? Isn't there a stream somewhere near here? He, he whispered. Oh, okay. Whispering, right. Isn't there a stream somewhere near here? That's right, there is a stream. If we are fast enough, we can catch the end of WrestleMania. Different stream. <laughs> it's at the edge of the next field, actually. There are fish in it, great big ones. You can watch them lying in the pools under the willow trees, waving their tails. It's the Golden Country, almost, he murmured. The Golden Country? Is it featured in the Golden Girls? Eh? Huh? It's nothing, really. A landscape I've seen sometimes in a dream. Look, whispered Julia. If she's whispering, why is there an exclamation point in this dialogue? A thrush had alighted on a bow, not five meters away, almost at the level of their faces. Perhaps it had not seen them. It was in the sun. Day in the shade. <clears throat> it spread out its wings, fitted them carefully into place again, ducked its head for a moment, as though making a sort of 
obeisance to the sun, and then began to pour forth a torrent of song. In the afternoon, hush the volume of sound was startling. Winston and Julia clung together, fascinated. The music went on and on, minute after minute, with astonishing variations, never once repeating itself, almost as though the bird were deliberately showing off its virtuosity. Sometimes it stopped for a few seconds, spread out and resettled its wings, then swelled its speckled breast and again burst into song. The bird is a symbol of freedom. We get it. Winston watched it with a sort of vague reverence. For whom, for what, was the bird singing? No. No mate, no rival was watching it. What made it sit at the edge of the lonely wood and pour its music into nothingness? Because it could! Because this is the meaning of freedom! Don't you get it yet? He wondered whether, after all, there was a microphone hidden somewhere near. He and Julia had only spoken in low whispers, and it would not pick up what they had said. But it would pick up the thrush. Perhaps, at the other end of the instrument, some small beetle-like man was listening intently, listening to death. But by degrees the flood of music drove all speculations out of his mind. It was as though it were a kind of liquid stuff that poured all over him and got mixed up with the sunlight that filtered through the leaves. He stopped thinking and merely felt... The girl's waist in the bend of his arm was soft and warm. He pulled around so that they were breast to breast. Her body seemed to melt into his, which is an image I am being grossed out of. Wherever his hands moved, it was all as yielding as water. Let me reread this sentence here. Wherever his hands moved, it was all as yielding as water. Their mouths clung together. It was quite different from the hard kisses they had exchanged earlier. When they moved their faces apart again, both of them sighed deeply. The bird took fright and fled with a clutter of wings. Ooh, human romance, no thanks. <laughs> I'm sorry, for a moment there I had the thought of the Woody Woodpecker live action film <laughs> swimming in my mind. Oh my gosh, that was so bad. <clears throat> Winston put his lips against her ear. No, he whispered. Not here, she whispered back. Come back to the hideout, it's safer. Quickly, with an occasional crackle of twigs, they threaded their way back to the clearing. When they were once inside the reading of suppling... The, the reading... The, I am reading... The ring of supplings, she turned and faced him. <clears throat> Excuse me. They were both breathing fast, but the smile had reappeared round the corners of her mouth. She stood looking at him for an instant, then felt at the zipper of her overalls. And yes! Exclamation point! It was almost as in his dream. Almost as swiftly as he had imagined it. She had torn her clothes off, and when the uh, and when she flung them aside, it was with that same magnificent gesture by which a whole civilization seemed to be annihilated. Her body gleamed white in the sun, but for a moment he did not look at her body. 
His eyes were anchored by the freckled face with its faint, bold smile. He knelt down before her and took her hands in his. Have you done this before? He is asking her if she has done this before because she is really, really young. I am quite irate. I am not even trying to put on a show, I am just... I am disgustipated! <laughs> there. That should lighten up the mood. <clears throat> Have you done this before? Of course! Hundreds of times! Well, scores of times, anyway. With party members? Yes, always with party members. With members of the inner party? Not with those swine, no. But there's plenty that would if they got half a chance. They're not so holy as they make out. I, I can't believe I am reading this passage here. And it's part of the same book. A book that, mind you, has this really nice old-school cover of Big Brother's all-watching eye in a black background, whereas the um, um, outer uh, corners of the book, they are in red. This is supposed to uh, call uh, into your memory some sort of communist propaganda and whatnot, because... Clearly, when Orwell wrote this, that's the primary form of authoritarianism he was thinking about. And yet, in this very same book, with this very nice old-school cover, we are in the midst of... Young Adult... Uh, romances, or what not, or just trashy, trashy romance novels, just that, this bloody thing. I, I am struggling for words, as you can tell, I am just so flustered and ruffled, this really ruffles my feathers, this grinds my gears, this defecates in my soup and other analogies. Dear Lord, his heart leapt. I am not dating a minor! Yay! Screw you. Scores of times she had done it. He wished it had been hundreds, thousands. Anything that hinted at corruption always filled him with a wild hope. Who knew, perhaps the party was rotten under the surface, its cult of strenuousness and self-denial simply a sham concealing iniquity. Now the book is uh, downright explaining, spelling out loud what the themes uh, are, what the themes of the novel are. We are... We have lost all nuance, everybody. All nuance is lost forever. If he could have infected the whole lot of them with leprosy or syphilis, how gladly he would have done so. Anything to rot, to weaken, to undermine. He pulled her down so that they were kneeling face to face. Listen. The more men you've had, the more I love you. Do you understand that? Are you my freaking pimp? That's what she should be saying. What kind of dialogue is this? What kind of... What is this nonsense? What is this stupid, stupid nonsense? Uh, <laughs> 
So at one point I fantasized of raping and killing you and now I'm going to be your pimp. Taking score of how many men you've been sleeping with. Because that's how love works, right? That's love. Cheese, Louise. This is not... This is not a swell read. <laughs> Not anymore, it isn't. Let me reread it, just to clarify any lingering doubt. Listen, the more men you've had, the more I love you. Do you understand that? Yes, perfectly. Well, good for you! I hate purity. I hate goodness. I don't want any virtue to exist anywhere. I want everyone to be corrupt to the bones. I am the great, mighty, um, impure man and I'm going to throw my, um, bitterness at you. Why in... Why is Winston slowly turning into a Saturday morning cartoon villain. Oh, I hate those Care Bears and their happiness and their love spreading. Oh, that's gross and disgusting. I want to spread hatred. Yes, corruption shall be spread amongst every man and woman in the world as I, Dr. Malignant Man, <laughs> I will Delete <laughs> love and friendship forever. <laughs> Just the way it is phrased. <laughs> I hate virtuosity. How oh, I hate. Those goody two shoes on the inner party, ooh, they are so disgustingly cased and all that. Ooh, I, my, we must turn up the sexiness and the, 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 the corruption. Yes, yes, corrupt the system. Yes. <laughs> I'm a pimp now. <laughs> Winston the pimp. Ah, it has a nice roll to the tongue. <laughs> well then, I out to suit you, dear. I'm corrupt to the bones. I'm corrupt to the bones, da na 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 na. Corrupt to the bones, da na 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 na. Bones, da na 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 na. Bed. Da na 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 na. Bed the bones, da na 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 na. Bed the bones. Bad. I'm sorry, I cannot stop <laughs> once I start with bad to the bones. <laughs> I love that song. You like doing this? I don't mean simply me. I mean the thing in itself. I adore it. Sex is great, you guys. I love having sex with everyone and everything. I could almost get behind such a character for their sexual uh, honesty and whatnot. It's great in concept, but she's not actually a character. She is a fetish. So no. That was above all what he wanted to hear. Not merely the love of one person, but the animal instinct, the simple, undifferentiated desire. That was the forest that would tear the party to pieces. They're going to fight political oppression with sex. They are going to fight political oppression with sex. I don't know if this is complete idiocy or genius. Absolute genius. My gosh, imagine reading this in the 60s. 
Yeah, man, we're fighting the man, y yeah, with sexual liberation, yeah, man, sex is awesome, uh, make love, uh, not war and whatnot, taking at the most extreme literal <laughs> of meanings. This is suddenly amazing. <laughs> it was going to take you know the power of love and by proxy making love as a, a way to uh, try to combat the oppression political and social oppression that is but I was not expect the book to go on such a literal and some would say even rather immature <laughs> route Okay, after I'm done reading, I will have to do a bit of research. I'm going to see how old Orwell was when he wrote this book, because that might explain a few things. Then again, if uh, the main character's age is supposed to reflect, pardon me, or Orwell's own age, that would imply he has been a teenager for the better part of his entire life. Hmm. Make of that what you will. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> what else can this chapter throw at my face before I lose my mind entirely? He pressed her down the, upon the grass, among the fallen bluebells. This time there was no difficulty. Presently, the rising and falling of their breasts slowed to normal speed, and in a sort of pleasant helplessness, they fell apart. The sun seemed to have grown hotter. They were both sleepy. Oh! He reached out for the discarded overalls and pulled them partly over her. Almost immediately, they fell asleep and slept for about half an hour. Oh, so what? No intricate, graphical, and overly flourished description of you having sex? No? It's just a one and done like that? I have to say, after everything, I'm a bit disappointed, Orwell. If you're going for the sex will save the world route, just, you might as well embrace it in its entirety. This feels self-baked. This feels a bit cowardly, you know? There is a discrepancy betwe uh, between what you claim is a absolute good and the way you describe it, which is to say you don't. Hmm. Interesting, isn't it? Winston woke first. He sat up and watched. And don't you people say to me that, well, you see, um, this is a sacred, important, um, intimate act between uh, two people, and um, it aims at celebrating it, but not to a point that it feels exploitative, so it's trying to be respectful about it. And yet, just a few lines earlier at the beginning of this page, the guy was literally asking the woman if she's had sex with lots of men. And then the author says, sex will defeat the party. So it's about as uh, not romantic or uh, glamorous as it can get. It's literally lustful, animalistic sex, which the author used, you know, those terms. He used those terms to describe it. 
let me reread it for you. Not merely the love of one person, but the animal instinct, the simple undifferentiated desire. That was the force that would tear the party to pieces. Do you see? It's not... It's not platonic sex, it's not romanticized sex, it's meant to be THE sex in the most carnal and visceral um, interpretation of it. And yet the author doesn't have the guts to go through with it. Clearly, obviously, the book would not be published if he had, you know, done so. But still, anything a little bit more suggestive in this description would have, you know, at the very least, given this direction that your book is taking a shiver of credibility. And I cannot believe I am complaining about the lack of sex <laughs> actually happening actually being descripted in this futuristic dystopian novel. What have you done to me, Orwell? What have you done to me? By this point, this is a completely different book, tonally and narratively, thematically. It's a completely different book from the, the one I started reading all those months or years ago. Oh, I'm... I'm just going to finish this chapter. Oh my gosh. Winston woke first. He sat up and watched the freckled face, still peacefully asleep, pillowed on the palm of her hand. Except for her mouth, you could not call her beautiful. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. She's the girl of your dreams. Everything about her is perfect. And then after you have sex with her, suddenly, ah, she's not that great. <sighs> okay. And it's raining again. Hooray. That reflects my mood at this point. There was a line or two round the eyes. If you looked closely... The short, dark hair was extraordinarily thick and soft. It occurred to him that he still did not know her surname or where she lived. Wow, gee, it's almost as if you don't know anything about the woman you just had animalistic sex with. <laughs> I cannot get this image out of my head now. Thanks for that. The young, strong body, now helpless in sleep, awoke in him, a pithing, protecting feeling. But the mindless tenderness that he had felt under the hazel tree, while the, tr the thrush <laughs> was singing, had not quite come back. He pulled the overalls aside and studied her smooth white flank. In the old days, he thought, a man looked at a girl's body and saw that it was desirable. And that was the end of the story. No, I'm serious, that's what's actually written here. No emotion was pure, because everything was mixed up with fear and hatred. Their embrace had been a battle, the climax of victory... It was a blow struck against the party. It was a political act. Their embrace had been a battle, the climax of victory. It was a blow struck against the party. It was a political act. Sex in the country, in the middle of nowhere was a political act. And with that golden line, <laughs> we end this chapter, and therefore this entire reading session, on a superbly high note, no doubt. This book 
This book makes a case for the Big Brother and the Inner Party actually incinerating all that literature <laughs> in the established lore of this very story. <sighs> oh my god, there is so much wrong, so much wrong concentrated in the spam of one single chapter. It's unbelievable. This is more mind-bendingly insane than any fanfiction I've read on this show prior to this book. And it's a, not only a successfully published book, it's one of the most important science fiction books of the 20th centuries. And yet, it features a guy telling a woman that he fantasized of raping her, and she laughs it off as if it, as if it is normal. <sighs> right, I'm done. I'm done. So, you make your own conclusions at this point. What do you think uh, about this book so far? Is it an overrated one? Is it just a forgivable product of its era? It isn't. Forgivable, I mean. Is it worth reading? Is it worth continuing? Do you even want me to continue reading it at this point, I don't know myself, I think I might just take a break from it and try to um, do other projects um, up until the problem with my connection is sorted out once and for all, I cannot have late night sessions, which means I cannot do collaborative videos with my many mates of Team Yume, so I am all alone, for all intents and purposes. Well, at least on the internet, I'm all alone. Whatever small fiber of internet connection I can get during the day, that is. So there is that. <clears throat> I do not have any clever last quip to leave you by, so I'm just going to stop this uh, recording. And uh, I guess I'll play a bit more of Xenoblade Chronicles too. Yes, I think I'll do that. Playing that relaxes me. Oh, it's not the best or most intelligent story ever written, mind you, but at least it's not 1984 by George Orwell. It has that going on, going on for it. Good night, everybody. <sighs> Have a nice life, I guess, and remember... I forgot.